Take your Bible, Genesis 21. Genesis 21. We're getting close. Genesis 22 is a good chapter to study. It is beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. Now, 21, what is that a multiple of? Seven. I wonder if there's a story or something in this chapter about the number seven. I just bet you there is. Okay? It, the name Beersheba. You've heard that before, right? It's all through the Bible. Beersheba, it's a city. Where did it get its beginnings? It began with a well. Think about what the well represents. A well of water springing up into everlasting life. Okay? And uh, a covenant. Think of a covenant. All covenants in the Bible are types of the new covenant. Okay? They are a picture, a prophetic picture. The covenant of the rainbow in Genesis 9. The first covenant God made is a covenant of the New Testament. The, the, the promise that Christ would be in the bow in the cloud. I got a Watchman broadcast going to be released today that deals with that. And uh, it's, it's beautiful. I love the picture of it. But anytime you see a covenant in the Old Testament, it is a foreshadowing of the New Testament. Everything is. But it's a foreshadowing of, a, of the New Covenant of grace and salvation by grace through faith. Okay? And that's what we're going to see. Genesis 21, verse 12. Now, what's happened, we talked about this last Sunday. What's happened is Sarah has asked Abraham to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. Ishmael is mocking Isaac. And it bristled Sarah. Got her bristled up real good. When a woman gets bristled, when a she-bear gets riled, when you get near a she-bear's cubs, what does a she-bear do? It'll kill you. It'll, a she-bear will kill you if you get close to her cubs. The, God made her so that she gets killing mad when she feels that her cubs are threatened. God designed that in the she-bear. And, and there's biblical things in here about that. A she-bear bereaved of her cubs. And God does. He makes, those, he makes a mama bear killing mad when she feels that her cubs are threatened or they have been touched in some way and she'll kill. She'll absolutely... Bears, a lot of times they see a human, they'll run from you. A she-bear, she won't do it. Sarah has practically turned into a she-bear. And she says, get rid of this woman and her son. I want him out. Abraham doesn't want to do it. He's grieved about it because Sarah asked him to. He knows that, you know, he loves his wife. Going, you got to do what your wife said. And he wants to be a blessing to his wife. So God said, to, God intervened and stepped in and said, Abraham, it's okay. Look at what God said. God, verse, 20, verse 12. God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water. And gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder. And the, child, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, the Bible names it this wilderness. Moses, by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, is writing down that this is Beersheba. But Beersheba has not been officially given its name yet. Okay, but Moses is... By the Holy Ghost telling you where she ended up was in Beer Sheba. Now, when you find out what this word means, this will make sense because it is in the wilderness or in the valley of Beer Sheba 
is where Hagar and Ishmael find salvation. Okay? Because God's going to save them both. So look at what happened. Uh, let's see here. Genesis 21. Uh, let's pick it up in verse 16. And she went... Uh, no, verse 15. And the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. Now the child, from what I could figure, was 13 years old. Ishmael was 13 years older than Isaac. Okay, that's when Ishmael was circumcised, I believe, if I, if I remember that right. I may be wrong, but it, I'm thinking Ishmael is 13 years old at this time. Uh, she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were, a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. She's a good mother. Amen. She knows that there's no hope for either one of them. Now I want you to listen to that. Anybody listening to me tonight? God will. God will allow you at times to get into a situation where it looks like there is no hope. I've been through this many times in some very serious ways. No hope, no salvation. No help from God. No help from anybody. It's over. I'm, I'm spent. This is it. Like that day I was being electrocuted. I had no hope of being rescued. No hope of anybody. No hope of the... the power letting me go I couldn't scream I couldn't move I couldn't touch I couldn't see anything except like a tie-dye t-shirt in my eyes and when I told God I didn't want to leave my wife and kids boom there was there was an angel there that gave just gave me a little shove and knocked me over and that was it God saved me. But I was in a place of no hope. And I want to tell you something. When you get into a place where you think there's no hope, there's hope. I promise you there's hope. So watch what happened. Verse 16 again. She put Ishmael away off as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him, against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of who? The lad. Ishmael. Not Hagar. Ishmael. The child. He's... God, a prompt, God made a promise, didn't he? To Abraham. Now listen to me. God made a promise to Abraham. Did God keep his promise? Did it look like Ishmael was going to die? In the very next chapter, Abraham and Isaac are going to go through this same thing. Isaac's going to die. Ishmael's going to die. That's it. There's no hope. But what, did, what, does, what does God do in both situations? Steps in. Brings salvation. Beersheba. When you find out what it means. Now those of you online, you're probably looking it up. You're cheating. Okay? When you find out what it means, you'll understand it better. 
God heard the voice of the lad. God made a promise concerning that lad. And he was not going to break that promise. And death itself was not going to keep God from keep making, keeping his promise. As soon as he heard the voice of the lad, the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. The angel of God is usually Christ in the Old Testament. Her called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Now, think about that. Where did Hagar go? To a place where she couldn't hear the voice of the lad. Where was God? Farther than that. But did he hear him? Yes. You're never too far away from God for him to hear you. Even when nobody else hears you, God hears you. What's well, good, isn't it? So watch this. God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand. For I will make him a great nation. And that usually implies salvation. We, all you people from Minnesota, Potosi, or Fredericktown, Kenya, we're all the same nation, aren't we? Black, white, brown, yellow, red, doesn't matter. We're all the same nation. And when God says, I'm going to make a great nation, you read the New Testament. We are a holy nation, a peculiar people. God calls us a nation of people. A, a new nation based on, not where we came from on this earth, but from our birth in heaven. Woo! God opened, verse 19, God opened her eyes. Wait a minute, she wasn't blind. But right in front of her was a well of water that she could not see. Roy, that deer I've got hanging up in my office that I'm so proud of, I shot it opening day and couldn't see it all day long and it was laying in front of me. Now it was a pretty good ways off. And I kept looking through the scope and I thought it was a big stone laying there. Big brown stone. You know, sometimes these fields are just full of r stones and rocks. And it wasn't until the next day that I looked at it. I moved my blind and got closer and I looked at it and I went, that's a, that's a deer. And I, when I walked over to it, that's a big old buck laying there. And I'm going, that's my deer. I shot it the day before. I thought I missed it. Because another one went running off. I didn't see the other one. God opened my eyes and let me see my deer a day later. So I'm standing here bragging about, yeah, that's my buck. I got him, boy. I, boy, I really nailed him. I let him sit a day out there. That's all right. It was cold. He was still good meat. God opened her eyes. There was... Hey, now listen to this. There is a well of water in most American people's house, isn't there? In most American, I'm not, I'm not really talking about city folk, like New York City and that California is accepted out of this. But in most Common American families, there's a big family King James Bible somewhere in that house. And you know what it is? It's a well of water that they can't see. 
But because the God of this world has blinded their eyes and they cannot see it for what it is. You start talking about the Bible, you start talking about Jesus and God to a lot of people. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about it. They think that Bible is written by man. They've got one in their family that was passed down from generation to generation. I have my grandma's Bible. I do. I, they, they cleared out my aunt and uncle's house, my cousins, and found my Meemaw's Bible in there. And they said, Mike needs this. And they sent that to me. My cousins, I, boy, I love them. They sent me that. And I started bawling like a baby. That was my Meemaw's Bible. That was a treasure to me. A well of water sitting in everybody's house and they don't recognize it. They don't know it. God has to open their eyes. And listen, when you start taking credit for your own salvation, that's where you go wrong. That God opened your eyes. You didn't. God opened your eyes. Just like that day in my office when God opened my eyes to this Bible. Said, Mike, this Bible is right. This King James Bible is right. And I immediately, I said, whoa, look at there. There's a well of water sitting right there in front of me. God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad. You listen to that. God was with him. That means God never left him. And he grew, dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. God blessed that lad, and he did. He became a great nation. And I, I suspect, I suspect that out of the seed of Ishmael, God's going to bring out a treasure of people. I suspect that. I can't prove it. I'm just looking at this and I know how God, when he says these things, he means them the way he says them. And I just think out of the seed of Ishmael, all those, whoever those Arab nations are that are of the seed of Ishmael, I just think God's going to save a bunch of them one day. That would be glorious, wouldn't it? Oh my goodness, that would be glorious. Now, look at verse 22. So now that's the end of that. That section, that story. Now we have another story in this, in chapter 21. Remember 21 is seven times, say three. Three. Seven times three. Am I right on that? I'm trying to remember my times tables. Seven times three, 21. And right here, We've already seen Beersheba, what it means. Now let's look at the story of how it got its name. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol. Now, from what I can tell, these are the Philistines. Usually not the friends of the Jews. But God had blessed Abraham so much that Abimelech, I think, was afraid to curse him. Because remember, God made a statement in Genesis 12. I will bless him that blesseth thee, and I'll curse him that curseth thee. And God still holds that true. I mean... Look at what happened with our radio station. God cursed those who cursed us. And he's blessed those who have blessed us. You see it? Because we're the seed of Abraham now by faith, by adoption. And because we are of the seed of Abraham... That promise carries over to us. Okay? So now, Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, you look at what they're saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Those guys are not idiots. Abimelech is wise. He knows that God is all over Abraham. God, I think, I think the Holy Ghost put it in his heart. 
God is with thee in all that thou doest. Now, you see, he's afraid of him now. Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. Phicol is scared to death of Abraham. And he wants Abraham to believe and know, I am your friend, I won't harm you, you swear to me that you won't harm me or my son or my grandson or anybody in my land. Swear to me that you won't hurt me, that you won't curse me, that God won't come after me and kill us all. Scared of him. He has the fear of God in him. He's right. And look at verse 24. Now, something's happened that we were not told about. But apparently that day or maybe the day before, Abimelech's men took over a well of water that Abraham owned and paid for and ran off the people, threatened to kill them, ran off the people that were using the well and they stole the well. And Abraham's got a complaint now. Look at what he said. Verse 24. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abraham's a little chaffed over this. That's my well. And your boys, you need to, you need to straighten out your boys. They beat up my people, my servants, and took that well. I bet you those guys got their head cut off. I bet you they got hung somewhere. And Abimelech said, I wot not who hath uh, done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet I heard I of it, but today. So Abimelech is saying, I've, I've not, this is news to me, I've not heard of this, I, I, I promise you, I have not ever heard of this, this is news to me, you're telling me this just now. And so watch this, now, Abraham, listen to this, who has the right to the well? Who has the right to the well? Who does? Abraham, it's Abraham's well. Abimelech's idiot guards took it away violently. They're, they're fixing to get their head cut off. I guarantee you, Abimelech's mad with them because he's afraid of Abraham. And I guarantee you he's going to take those guys and he's going to make them pay for it with their own blood. That's just me thinking it out. But look at what Abraham did. Even though Abraham had a right to the well, he still paid Abimelech for it and made a covenant with him. And what was the covenant? What did, how, what did, what did he pay it with? Look at this. And Abraham said, how many you lambs? Did I tell you there was a seven in this? Seven. And who's a lamb? When you see a lamb in the Bible, who is it? It's Jesus Christ. And the number seven not only has the meaning of completion and perfection, but it also has the meaning of sanctification and forgiveness of sins. What you're seeing here is a story of Christ buying our redemption. Abraham, in the form of the seven lambs, is buying Abimelech's salvation. He's buying his redemption. Even though Abraham doesn't owe Abimelech a dime to get that well back. Abimelech, or excuse me, Abraham, listen. Abraham is going to pay a debt that he does not owe. Who did that for us? Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this 
well. Mm. Wherefore, he called that place Beer Sheba. Now let's do a little ing- let's do a little language study. Sheba. If I if I change the vowel and say Sheba, what does it sound like I'm saying? What'd you say? Shabbat. What does that word mean? Sabbath. What does the word Sabbath mean? Shabbat, Sabbath, Sheba means seven. Here is from Blue Letter Bible, the word Beersheba. It means, Beer means well, well of the sevenfold oath. Sheba is the number seven. Isn't that neat? Where did, where did Hagar and Ishmael get stuck at? Where, where was it they were going to die and yet God saved them? Where was it? Beersheba. The land, it's a land of salvation is what it is. Beersheba. Let's go back. Wherefore he called the, that place Beersheba because they, there they swear both of them. So actually the King James Bible is sort of defining what Beersheba means. But it's not giving you all the little details. But that's what Sheba, the, that part of the word there means seven. Sevenfold. And it's because it was a sevenfold oath. These seven ewe lambs that Abraham paid to Abimelech, a debt that he did not owe, to show as a sign that this well is what I've dug. But I'm paying a debt that I do not owe. And that's Christ. Thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up and Phicol, the chief captain of the host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. So the Bible, that's what the Bible said. Then it goes, if you look in, uh, I looked a little bit lower down here. And it said in Strong's Concordance, a proper name of a location, Beersheba, well of seven, explained in Genesis 21 as a place of swearing by seven lambs or a well of oath. Um, so that's the literal interpretation of it. The, the swearing by seven lambs, Beersheba. Now, uh, just look at this, Genesis 21, 33, and Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Who was he calling? Who did Abraham call? Isaiah 9, this is one of those Christmas verses. For unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. I never could figure that out. Like, the government is getting after him. No, that's not what it means. It means that all of the authority of the world he carries on his shoulder. He is, he, in other words, the buck stops here at Christ. I'm going to rule the world is what that means. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful and Counselor. Roy, that's why you get such a thrill out of certain places in the Bible. Like Ecclesiastes 1 and other places. is because Jesus is counseling you. He's your counselor and my counselor. In times where... We're down, we're low, we're depressed, we're thinking about things we should not think about, and we get in the Bible, and Jesus begins to counsel us and tell us, this is how you come out of this, this is how you get blessed, this is how you're going to make it through the day. Somebody say amen. The mighty God. Tell that to the Jehovah's Witness. The everlasting Father. Tell that to the Mormons. They don't believe none of that. The Prince of Peace. Isn't that something? 
that Jesus is the Son and yet He is the everlasting Father. Because He said, I and the Father are one. We're the same. I don't understand it, but I sure believe it. Amen? I believe it. And the Prince of Peace. And like I've seen in Sunday school this morning, you want peace? You need a ruler. You need the Holy Spirit ruling in your hearts to give you peace. The peace of Jesus Christ. Amen? The peace of knowing that no matter how bad this day was, it's a whole lot better than hell. Because you're not going there. Amen. Amen. Man, I did it. Oh, no. I ran out of scripture. Genesis 22. Turn there. I can't believe I did that. I'm so sorry. I ain't letting you out till four. Genesis 22. Let's break this down. Now, let's get in. Let's get into the meat of this. Now, watch this. The number 22 is the number for revelation. You can break the Bible down. There's 66 books. That's a that's a base of 22. 22 times 3 is 66. It just so happens that the final book of the Bible is called what? The Revelation. How many chapters does it have? 22 chapters. And I'm nuts for believing that. But it's a fact. So in Genesis 22, can we expect that God is going to reveal something? He sure is. God's going to reveal. And again, Israel, most practicing Jews know this story by heart. They may not read Hebrew, they speak Yiddish. But they know this story by heart. Why then, when they learn about Christianity, that we believe that God sent His only begotten Son to this world to die for our transgressions, to be offered up for our sins. Why don't the Jews who know this story, why don't they believe that? Blind, Paul said it, Beloved, be not ignorant. Of this one thing, that blindness in part is happened unto Israel. Israel, the Jew, can only see Genesis 22. That's the only thing they can see. They can't see in the four Gospels the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. They can't see it. They can't see Paul's doctrine explaining what Genesis 22 means. They cannot see it. Because God has blinded. They're partially blinded. Which means they read the Old Testament. They read it all day long. They know the stories of the Old Testament by heart. They know the Passover. They know, where, they know the feast days. They know, they know, I watched the documentary about them practicing... Tabernacles, those Jews that live in Brooklyn, they have patios and they put booths out on their patios and they, they sit out there and eat and fellowship, and sometimes sleep out there. Gets a little cool sometimes, but they sleep out there, eat and sleep, fellowship, rest, because that's their, that's their feast day. They practice that, but they don't know what it means. They cannot figure it out. You, and you cannot explain it to them. You can't, I mean, it just, it won't work. They are partially blinded. They cannot see the New Testament yet. But one of these days, boom. And the Jews, just like those guys that walked with Jesus after his resurrection. And Jesus began to share with them from the Old Testament all these types and stories about him being in the Old Testament. 
And when they finally figured out it was Jesus, he disappeared. And they went, that was him. That was the Messiah. <gasps> We're going to go back and read our Old Testament. We're going to read our Bibles again and see all these things that he said in there. I bet those guys re sat and read their Bible for weeks. Didn't need a, didn't need a bite. Because I'm telling you, that's practically what I did when God began to open my eyes to the wonderful things in this Bible. Just boom, 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 boom. I was, read, I was reading nonstop. I was reading everything I'd get my hands on. Let's look at it. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Hold it! Does God tempt man? Does God tempt man there's a verse in the new testament i don't have it prepared yet but it says plainly that god tempteth no man do you think that god tempts you to sin to see if you're going to sin or not no he doesn't have to do that he's got somebody already that'll do it for him who is that Satan. Who is it, Jaden? Satan. All right. Thank you for raising your hand. Yeah, but it's Satan. You're right. He's the tempter of every man. Okay, so God does it. It's just like God sending the spirit to the 400 prophets of Ahab. God didn't have to lie to Ahab. There was a spirit said, I'll do it for you. I lie good. I lie like a dog. God said, go do it. You're good at it. I'll, I'll reward you till I throw you in the pit. <laughs> Amen. God's going to get rid of him. <laughs> Amen. In this sense of the word, it means test. Not tempt to sin. But remember, let's, 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 Let's look at this. Let's let's get it and let's get some doctrine here. First Peter, turn there. First Peter. What is God testing? What is on trial here? Abraham's faith. Um Verse first Peter chapter one, verse six, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through many fold temptations. That's us on certain days, is it not? Tempted to do this, tempted to do that, tempted to things that we know are wrong. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. What was Abraham going to do with Isaac after he stabbed him? He was going to light a fire. They carried wood to build a fire. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Abraham is such a great man. He's exalted by three religions. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all respect and revere Abraham. And regard Abraham as their father. All three of them. That's how great a man Abraham was. But God is greater. And God is going to test Abraham not, not just to test Abraham, but number one, to test Abraham, to put his tr faith on trial. Number two, to show us the typology of the cross and Calvary. In Genesis 22, to show us Jesus Christ in this passage. Because it says, take now thy son, thine only son. Who's the only son? Who's the only begotten son? Jesus Christ. 
So Isaac is a type of Christ. And Abraham is a picture of God the Father who is sending his own son to be offered up for the sins of people, sins that he did not commit. That's a typology. That's another reason why God did this. Third reason why God did this. To help us in our trials. That if we will just have faith like Abraham and trust God, God will do a miracle and get us through. And we won't have to do what Ab Abraham thought he was going to have to do. God always has a different outcome than what we invent in our minds. And he's always got a different plan. Somebody say amen. I could, I could tell you stories of plans that I made that, were, that just fell apart. Then I learned how to wait on the Lord and let God do something. Let God reveal it. Let God bring it to pass. I still am learning that. I got a life to learn that lesson. But that's what this is here for. This is for our what, what uh, Paul said, these things for, are for our learning and our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. Abraham passed the test. You can do it too. How can you do it? Just trust God. You know, and you know what it is? You believe what God said. And I, I'll be honest with you. Matthew was my firstborn son. I loved him when he was born and God used him in my life to really get a hold of me and change things about me for his sake. I wanted to be a good father to him. But for God to ask me to take him outside at a young age and offer him up for a sacrifice, I don't know. I couldn't shoot my son. I couldn't kill him. But Abraham had a promise from God. What was that promise? Is that through Isaac shall thy seed be called. And we know the outcome because it's told to us that Abraham was thinking that even if he killed him, that God was going to resurrect him from the dead. We know this because the Holy Ghost knew what Abraham was thinking. God was going to resurrect Isaac from the dead. Now think about that. Think about that for a minute. Is Isaac Jesus? Yes, he's a type of Jesus. Did Jesus resurrect from the dead? You see, everybody that believed in Jesus when they're watching him die on the cross... When they see him die on the cross and it's over with, how do they spend the next three days? They're going. Even though Jesus told them in three days, I'm going, to, I'm going to rise again. And sure enough, three days later, here's Jesus and they're going. <gasps> Can you imagine how glorious that was? Thomas who doubted all the way until he saw Jesus bowed at his feet and he said, my Lord and my God. Brought him to his knees. So that's why this story is in here. It's for us. For our faith. Let's read it a little bit. Oh, it's past four o'clock. But anyway, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. Did God love Jesus? But did God love the world that he gave his only begotten son? Whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And we'll find out next Sunday night that the place where Abraham offered Isaac was Golgotha. That's what I believe. 
same place, and it was 2,000 years later, exactly, and that's how God operates. Every 2,000 years, boom, 2,000 years, boom. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Let's pray. Father, it's been a good study in your word. Thank you, Lord, uh, for those that hear it, those that have joined us. Father, thank you, Lord, for blessing us with your word. There's deep things, Father, if we take our time, pay attention to them, read it over and over again and get the meaning out of it, get the sense of it. And Father, Lord, we'll read it again years later and get something else out of it. That's just how wonderful your word is. Lord, continue to bless this church. Thank you for everything that you've done. Use us for your glory and your kingdom's sake. We love you. Thank you for being our God, our Father, our Savior, our friend, our brother. Holy Spirit, thank you for being our guide. Helping us, Father, when we're down, when we're low, giving us comfort. Thank you. For being our God, we love you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. You are dismissed.